before I truly start, right, let me share something that I've been observing about Malaysians and about trying to do things, trying to build companies, trying to achieving things in Malaysia. So the environment I grew up in Malaysia, like um, in a lot of ways, it's a very positive environment. But I've come to observe that it's also a very negative environment. Everything that you read on the news about what the government's trying to do, the environment I grew up in is very skeptical. You know, my friends, my family, they all criticize, you know, oh, what la, we waste money, ah. why you want to do this, ah? waste money? Are you stupid, ah? why you want to do that? Why do you do like this? Why can't they do like that? You know, I see my dad sitting at home trying to become a government advisor all of a sudden. <laughs> Today, it's not that different. These things, except it's not done at a dinner table on the copy time, it's done in Facebook. Everyone's a government advisor on Facebook these days. Everyone. And in spite of this type of um, environment, right, you have a team of people here um, who I've seen work day and night and go on without sleep and they, have, they don't only battle like the system and all that. Sometimes they have to battle themselves. Sometimes they have to battle the uh, feedback from their family. You say, hey, why you never go join the company? Why are you going to join government for? Hey, you don't join government agency. Sure or not? So a lot of friends and family also like, give a lot of the people here at Magic a lot of um, different opinions about things they should be doing. But let me tell you this. Yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, I was talking to some uh, founders, some entrepreneurs, uh, and some of you guys from Penang and from Johor Bahru, right? And then we were observing the second thing, which is in the past five years of me building companies and doing things here in Malaysia, there's never been so many potent speakers and content and programs packed in five days. This five days here alone at Magic has more important content and has pulled together more people from across Malaysia than I've seen in all of my five years of building business over here. And this is just factual. I'm not even, I'm just, I'm just like counting, you know, I'm just counting. You go back and you count the past five years of events, all the speakers have flown down, all the founders, all entrepreneurs, all the people who are here in this room, you just count it yourself. So with that in mind, for the magic team over here who day in, day out, may be fa battling with different types of opinion, and maybe going against the grain, and maybe working into the night tirelessly, I want them to hear something else. For those of you who agree with me, I want you, I want you guys to cheer with me, magic, a couple of times, really loudly, with all your heart, and only if you mean it. Okay, can you do this with me? Okay, a big up for magic! 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 And for those team members in the room over here who've been working so hard, right, when the times that you guys just feel like giving up, I want you to hear what you just heard. Let me hear it again. Okay, you guys hear that? You guys remember that? Okay, so they asked me to come here and talk about pitching. Um, I'm gonna, I think it's quite ironic, because like, um, I'm up till I was 26, 24, 25 or 26 years old. I don't think I've ever pitched anyone before in my life. Um, so my name is Kylie. That's my Twitter handle. You can tweet me if you've got questions. And um, I've never seen myself as a salesperson or a pitch person or even an entrepreneur. I never wanted any of those things. I mean, I grew up, I went to Chinese school over here, Chinese primary school, Yi Chai Hua Xiao. You know, I went to a government school here, SMK Damansara Jaya, just doing my own thing. I like to draw. I like to paint. I just wanted to create things. So when I was 15 years old, I realized that the internet helped you create things. So I picked up web design. I had to call out a person in this room. I don't know if you're here. TJ, are you here? TJ? Oh, it's another room. Okay, well, TJ is busy mentoring startups in a design track. His name is Tan TJ. So during PMR, he actually taught me how to design websites. So I just wanted to thank him publicly. So TJ taught me how to build websites. And um, so I use websites to just build things I wanted to build. So I didn't, nobody taught me to pitch. Nobody told me pitching was important. So one day I decided to create companies. I thought that if you created a company, you can get more people and create more things. It was just a simple idea. And so I, uh, as Cheryl mentioned, I created an online news company, says.com, which uh, was merged with some assets from Catcher and uh, now exists as a public listed entity, Rev Asia Berhad. Um, I also built a group buying company, uh, which was sold to Groupon. And all these businesses I built with a fellow Malaysian, Joel Neo, who also grew up in a very similar middle-class upbringing. And in that process, I started to realize how critical pitching was. So 
as I went along my journey, I kept getting reminded that pitching can almost be a make or break situation in so many cases. Because I started to invest money into local companies and foreign companies in the US. I started to mentor at, uh, in Silicon Valley in 500 Startups Accelerator Batch. And all these companies, all these entrepreneurs were building such amazing things. But sometimes the pitch was so bad, you will never know. So um, eventually I decided to work with Dave McCullough, the founder, to set up a Southeast Asia fund to bring some of the best practices in pitching from 500 startups all the way here to Malaysia, all the way here to Southeast Asia, and also, of course, a global platform of other kind of best practices. Um, for some context, uh, 500 Startups is the world's most active venture capital firm. We have a global seed fund. We've got two accelerators in Silicon Valley and one accelerator in Mexico, and we also build ecosystems everywhere we go. We've got, till date, about 850 plus investments over 40 countries, and all this within four years. Collectively, our startups has raised over a billion US dollars. Me personally, with Southeast Asia Fund, I invested in 30 companies in the past seven months, and we're still going strong. With all of this, you can imagine that we're gonna, I'm gonna be hearing a ton of pitches everywhere I go. In fact, like at 500 startups, like we spent about a whole month with 33 companies on the accelerator pitching. Over here in Southeast Asia, I've seen about 450 companies to decide on 30 companies. All of them had to be pitching. And so the first step for today, I think with what little time I have, the least I can do is for all of you who, are, who dream of building great companies, all of you who are already building great companies, maybe I can just help you pitch just that bit better. So when the time comes, you need to tell someone what your company is about, maybe they'll be able to see it. So I would like to introduce one simple idea. I call this the pitch effect. What's the pitch effect? I'll tell you that everywhere you go, in every mentor, in every kind of uh, tech, uh, tech blog you read or anywhere on the internet, you get a lot of advice about pitching. You should say this, you should say that, you should talk about this, talk about that. There's so much to talk about. So what a lot of founders do, and I've seen this a lot in Malaysia as well, they, we, we go around and try to stuff as much as we can into the pitch. And then you go to a real pitching event and it's only three minutes long. Then you complain to the organizer, Oi, where can three minutes? How like that, three minutes? You know, I got this, I got that, I got that, I them all, everything, three minutes, cannot, uh, not fair, not fair. <laughs> but but I'll, tell you, I'll tell you that all the international startup pitch events, all three minutes max, five minutes max. So everything you want to say, everything you think you should say, well, you better say it in three to five minutes. But what I would also say is, I don't want to focus on what exact things to say, because people miss the point. The point is, people might even forget exactly how you said what you said but they may walk away from the room and you, they may remember how you made them feel. I'm pretty sure I stole that quote from somewhere, but that's exactly how I feel. So with that in mind, the pitch effect is not about what words you're gonna put in your pitch. It is about how your pitch makes people feel. And I started to observe the feelings I got when I decided to invest in some companies. I was on the phone with this uh, one company with a Malaysian founder in it, they're based in Singapore currently, but 25 minutes into the Skype call, I told them, I am going to invest in your company. Tell me how. I look back on a lot of situations like that and I tried to observe, how did I feel? And I realized that for a lot of other co-investors that I invest with, we feel in the beginning, when, 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 when the founder starts telling us about the company, we feel that we want to know more. They say like one or two lines of things, I'm like, wow, man, he tell me more about it. Hey, I start, I start feeling like I want to ask a lot of questions because I'm so interested. That's the first feeling you want to let them feel. The next one is that at some point, they have to feel that it's a great idea. I mean, of course, it's quite obvious because sometimes they'll feel, hey, that's a really stupid idea. Then they'll start trying to give you ideas. That's actually kind of sometimes a bad sign. They're like, hey, why don't you do this instead? That's usually because they feel like your idea is quite dumb, right? So if they think what a great idea it is, they usually give you feedback like, wow, you know, your idea has the potential to do all of this, you know, and they start talking about things in that way. The third feeling is that they, have, they need to start feeling that it's going to be so huge. This is a sales pitch that they're giving themselves. They're like, wow, man, this can be huge. You know, and they start telling it to themselves. The fourth thing is that at some point when you do talk about your team, they're like, whoa, out of all the teams in the world, this is the team that's going to do it. And the last one is that they're itching to feel like they want to be part of this. 
So these, there's probably a few other effects that you want to have or whatnot. And I will say that you don't even have to have all five. If you've got like two or three, which is really strong, that's enough to get you to get the next meeting, to talk some more and build your case. So with your pitch, you can pick any one of these and be really good at one or two of them. In the best case scenario, maybe you're good at five. Today, I want to give you a few tips and tricks for each of these effects to maybe help each of them kind of tune it up just a little bit so you can achieve the pitch effect that you want. So I won't do this in kind of like a lecture style, but I'd like to invite a couple of uh, startups to come up here so we can just fix up the pitches in real time. Um, last night, I was at um, the uh, Golden Gate uh, Ventures dinner. If Golden Gate Ventures over here, anyone from Golden Gate Ventures here? The last night's dinner must have been really good. Then. <laughs> so the, um, um, I met one founder who was uh, building a um, promotion tracking app. I think his name is Benny Toh or something. Any, anybody know? No, no, it's not Benson. Benson's table app. Benny, right? Is Benny here? Hey, Benny, are you here? He was at the dinner last night, so probably, you know, it's, he went out till late. I left earlier because I know I have to wake up this morning, you know, so, but clearly he doesn't. But, okay, so I would like to invite him because his pitch was terrible. Um, if <laughs> So it's, hey, I'm here to help, okay? <laughs> okay, so who feels they want to get the pitch tuned up? Right? Somebody who already has a startup who is in pitch mode. I'll, just, I'll show all hands. Uh, anyone? We've got one, two people having their hands raised up. Two, three, some skits get a bit. Okay, some guy up there. So, um, okay, since you, your, your hand was so fast, Deep, why don't you come on up, Deep? Big round of applause to Deep. Um... Let me, let me get you a chair, actually. Let me get you a chair. Yeah, i get you a chair. Because you're going to be here for a while, man. Can somebody get him a chair? Can I borrow this chair? Maybe I get this chair. Sorry, yeah. I kick you out of your chair. I'll give you a lap dance, but what do you think? Okay. Sit right in the center, man. It's all you, bro. It's all you. Okay, what does the startup do? Uh, we build CRM solution for small businesses in Asia. You build CRM solutions for small businesses in Asia. All right, cool. So typically when you start your first half minute of pitch, you usually start with that, right? Yeah. Okay, tell me more. Uh, our solution focuses on smaller businesses who wants to manage their sales, marketing, and customer support in a much more efficient way. Uh, most of the smaller businesses don't use any kind of IT solution because they think it's expensive, it's difficult to use. So that's where we come in. It's a cloud-based solution, easy to use, a lot cheaper as compared to all the other existing super-duper SAP Oracle kind of solution, but still does the job to make your business grow better. Not bad for robot. I'm kidding. <laughs> just joking, just joking, just joking, just, just joking, just joking. <laughs> so here's a couple of tips, right? And we'll work together on this. No, it was actually pretty good, right? So firstly, if you have some degree of traction in your business, if you have some sort of progress with your business, like I'd like you to lead with some traction. So tell me, tell me how many customers you already have. Uh, we have around 100 customers across Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, some of the big names are uh, McDonald's in Singapore. Of course, a small department in there using our solution, but yes, big name is there. Uh, we work with MYOB accounting software company, one of the largest IT uh, accounting company. Uh, we have few other companies which are a bit uh, different in the sense they are in insurance and even the building management as well. So the, these aren't that small businesses. They're kind of really medium, is it? 90% of my customers are within 5 to 10 users. Uh, only 10, 20% are the customers who are a bit bigger, maybe 50 users. Yeah. All right, interesting. Okay, so he's got traction, and his traction is pretty amazing. You're very lucky because a lot of startups, maybe the earlier stage, they don't have any traction to lead with, right? Now, I would say that if he started his pitch saying that, hey, Kylie, I built something for small businesses, which 100 businesses across Malaysia and Singapore use, including McDonald's, property management companies, up all the way to small businesses. I don't even know what you're building, dude, but I want to know more. I'm like, oh, wow, 100 over comes to what McDonald's use your business? What, what, what are you building, bro? It's like, I'd be interested to know more. Now, now you tell me, what's better than traction is traction over time. So how long did it take for you to get the 100 customers? Uh, we are in business since last three plus years. Um, we are growing last three years 100% every year. So uh, how many customers did you get in the last six months? Uh, Ten. A bit slow, slow down, how you grow? Uh, one of the things which has changed is actually a lot of bigger customers are coming uh, to us. I mean, that's where the difference comes in. One project takes a bit bigger, uh, sales cycles are a bit longer. Thanks for your honesty. Let's uh, leave that out of pitch for now. 
Um, <laughs> so most of your customers, you got them like after you launched, did you get the first 100 customers within three months? Did you? So it was like a slow linear growth across three years. Okay, but you said 100% growth year on year, is it? So that means, oh, sorry? Okay, that, that's not bad. Um, okay, okay, that's okay. Now, I, I don't want to encourage him to lie, but <laughs> if at some point of his uh, 100 companies, let's say, for example, right, after you launched, the moment, the first week you launched, you had like 20 companies sign up. Or let's say that out of the 100 companies you signed up, 50 of them signed up in the last month. So if you can find like a section of time or some kind of perspective on time, you will not only impress people with the traction, you impress them with traction over time. So for yourself, you said 100% month, a year-on-year -year growth. Your revenue is growing 100% yearly. I think that's not bad. That's okay. So you could start your pitch by saying, hey, Kylie, uh, I built a, uh, an app, a cloud-based app for small businesses, which 100 businesses in Malaysia and Singapore use, like if, including McDonald's and all these property management companies, and the revenue of my company is growing 100% year-on-year. Let me tell you what this is. So I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I, I would have the effect. I want to know more. Now, you see, the secret trick over here is that I want to know more because he didn't tell me everything. <laughs> have you guys seen, like, um, say, BuzzFeed or Viral Nova? You look at the link bait headlines that they write. They're like, what this 26-year-old woman said to her grandmother was shocking. <laughs> and I'm like, you have to click on it. Wow. I'm like, what? So I, I mean, I don't know what it is. What, what did the daughter say? So I go and click on it, right? And then they get more traffic. And then BuzzFeed's worth a billion dollars. So now I'm not encouraging you to use clickbait or rather pitch bait. But, I'm, but you can see where I'm going with this. What I'm really encouraging is to put your best foot forward. In all cases of your pitch, if you got traction, you better put it up front because that's the strongest thing you've got. For a lot of you who maybe just started, maybe you guys have your idea, you don't have like this type of traction that this very lucky uh, Deep guy has. His name's Deep, by the way. So his, um, you guys need to find another thing to put your best foot forward with. So um, I met a company out of the JFDI uh, incubator in Singapore. Any folks from JFDI here? Oh, they've been around. Um, oh, there you go. Uh, Glintz, right? So like um, when they first uh, pitched to me, right, like I... I kind of didn't understand the idea, really. I mean, the guy was a good speaker, but I, I, I somehow, I just, it, it didn't hit me. But then, like, um, what was interesting, now I'll keep you for the whole thing, bro. You're going to be with me all the way. All right. <laughs> Lucky you. Um, the, um, what happened to Glintz was that I didn't understand their pitch, but I understood something. He mentioned that he and his, all of his founders are top scholars in Singapore. And they are, said, despite being still students, one's going to Berkeley, one's going to Stanford, one's going to UPenn, I think. And the three of them are working on a college student-based thing. And they say they have a lot of time. Their target market is all students and no, 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 no. So for some of us, the fact that you went to a good school may be interesting, maybe not interesting. But the fact that three people are ready to drop out of three prestigious colleges if the idea works, I don't know what they're building, but I want to know more. So imagine that Oswald and Glintz opened up and said that, Kylie, I want to tell you about business, right? Me and my co-founders were all studying in Stanford, in Berkeley, in Wharton, and we're still students. But if we get this right, we're going to quit and we're going to build a big company. What are they building? I don't know. But I want to know more. So the second point about if you don't have any traction, you're putting your best foot forward. If it happens to be your team, if you guys didn't go to a good school, maybe got a few years of experience in HR, and you've been in HR or something. So the guy who I wanted to call up here, right, the uh, Benny guy, he, I couldn't understand his app at all, man. He said, oh, I'm building a promoter tracking app. And I thought his English, you know, was, do you mean promotion tracking app? Like, no, 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 promoter tracking app. So what do you mean promoter? So apparently he's like the people who kind of promote sales stuff, you know, at events and all that, right? So the deeper I went with him, I started to realize that all of his career, the past 12 years, he has been actually building things related to the event and the promotion space. And he's found something so unique to a unique problem in promotion that's so unique that 20 large uh, brands like Unilever, Fonterra and all are signing yearly contracts with him and paying him monthly. So he's got superb traction, and he has he found something so unique in all of his years of experience, but it took me 20 minutes to know that. 20 minutes. 
What if I decided to walk away at minute 19? <laughs> okay, so you've got no time. You've got three minutes. Sometimes you only have 30 seconds. Put your best foot forward. Now, if you really, really need to explain what your app actually is, because eventually you need to. <laughs> Once I want to know more, you want to tell me more. Just now, the way you explained your app, can you explain it again? Like, what is your app? Uh, it's an online system for customers to manage their customers. Like, I want to know who are my customers, from which uh, background industry, how much I'm billing them, uh, any support issues I have to keep track of. Basically, it's managing your operations in terms of sales and marketing and support. Now, yeah, this, this is actually better than earlier because you mentioned CRM for small businesses, right? So, um, how, do, how do we want to make it, uh, just to tighten it up a little bit. Here, I would always introduce your company and what you do from the customer's perspective. So you say, my startup helps small, medium businesses who have overflowing with customer orders, but they don't <laughs> have enough team or management or resources. My software helps them deal, know all of their customers, what they're doing, save them five hours a day. So instead of thinking we're doing this for the customer, you bring the customer in front. This way, right, from an empathetic standpoint, when you pitch someone, they can imagine if they are the customer, right? My startup helps busy moms who run around all day trying to juggle their career and take care of their children to save up to four hours a day by da -da -da -da. So it's from a customer's perspective. And you can think, can you think of how many, do you know a mom like that? Are you a mom like that? You know, we can get into the, the emotion of it. So that's going to help them feel that customer. Now let's move on to the next pitch effect. You guys, you guys good with this effect? Okay, let's go on to the next one. Now, what a great idea. How do you get from, what a stupid idea, let's give him some ideas. Hey, I think I should expand to this. Why don't you build a feature like that? How do you get away from what a stupid idea to what a great idea? Let's, let's have a look. So I talked about it earlier, about um, the customer's perspective. Now, one thing you can do to feel what a great idea it is, is to amplify the customer's pain, the customer's problem. So tell me, out of all, since you're serving 100 customers, right? When you talk to your customers or when they talk to you, what do you relate as the deepest pain? Uh, I mean, as a running a business, small business, there are tons of issues, but two, two three things which are very, uh, one is to bill a customer on the time, uh, especially these days when a lot of subscription kind of model is there where you have to bill regularly. Uh, credit cards, auto, not so much popular in Asian side, so you really need to do the physical way of billing it. That is very big pain point. Uh, second thing is uh, keeping track of expiring of warranties or some kind of a contracts. That these two are the most uh, critical point which we have seen. People lose tons of money. I mean, even a bigger companies I've seen, they say, hey, you know, all of, almost like 20% customers we haven't even built because we are not tracking, you know, when are their contracts are expiring. This is one of the big pain point. The moment you close this thing, they make a lot of money out of it. Fantastic. So um, we can't amplify that with a few, like we tighten it up when you go home, right? You're getting what I'm saying, right? The way I would amplify that is that, so my startup helps small businesses um, help deal with all the customers they forget to build with, right? And manage all the customers that they're having. Now this problem for small businesses is a classic small business to startup problem. You got a founder running all over the place, catching, or trying to put out fires, and then they forget to build their customers. They even forget that the, that guy was actually the customer. Even though people ask me how many customers you have, they even forget they can't count anymore because they're too busy putting out fires, right? Think of how many small businesses across Malaysia and Singapore have this problem. Yeah, there's a lot, huh? So we're trying to amplify the customer's perspective. You can try to do it with less and less words. Now, you need to amplify how your solution actually works from their perspective, which you already did because you said it's going to sort everything out for them. So I think you, you do a pretty good job of that. So you're going to catch to that. Now, Amplifying how the solution works. Um, there's one Thai company, uh, a company in Thailand, an accelerator in Thailand called True Cube that I was working with. Um, they had a software which does CRM but for people who sell on uh, Facebook and people who sell on Instagram. So after really trying to amplify their problem and solution, what I discovered was that a lot of people who do sell Instagram and Facebook, some of them actually do sell quite a lot of clothes. But the big pain is that Oh, have I banked in the money yet? Oh, do you have this size? You know, they just kind of manage all the conversation in chat. So it's, it's, it takes up a lot of their time. And they've calculated that if they use this uh, software in Thailand called Salsuki, um, they can save up to three hours a day. Or they can save up to 10, min uh, save up to, uh, 10 minutes per transaction or some kind of math like that. Now, let's say they could save three hours a day with the software. 
what I would say in the pitch is that my software helps them get so efficient that they save up to three hours a day. Now think of how much money the small business will make with three hours a day. And depending on how theatrical you want to get, think of how... Think of how his baby boy feels when the father comes home and spends extra three hours staring into his eyes. <laughs> check, check. So I give you, so I give you. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so it depends how far you want to go. But I think you get my point, right? You want to amplify the solution so much that even the VC hearing it, oh, tear comes on her eyes. And so, oh. <laughs> now, to make this idea feel like it's really, really great, you need to give two kinds of uh, things. You want to juxtapose qualitative measures and quantitative measures for maximum effect. So just now when I said that the business owner has a t three extra hours a week to come back and spend time with the family. That's qualitative, it's like emotional. And then you tell them, is that you think about how many business owners in Malaysia wants that. Well, about uh, 5.2 million, the last time I checked, like the Malaysian statistics or whatever, right? Yeah, you could say that. But what you wanna do is that you wanna take the qualitative, qualitative measure and then you wanna add a quantitative thing to it. Now this trick, you guess who I learned it from? I learned it from Obama. I thought that dude, right, all his speeches are the same. Like his script writers need fresh material. Like he would say things like, I'm gonna, we're gonna deploy this healthcare program to help all the 500 Americans out there from the farmer who's in the Midwest looking at his daughter. Right up to the Wall Street banker who haven't slept in five days. On all 300,000 Americans who are working on, I mean, he does it all the time, man. It's like, hey, that's a pretty good trick, right? So I just took that. <laughs> and I'm giving all my startups, right? So you can do the same thing. So this is like the Obama trick, right? <laughs> so you see, if we take one or two sentences to say that, you know, the small business owner is running around and even forgetting to build the customers, he lives every hour as though he was going to die. And they use my software. They free up three hours of extra a week on average to spend time with the family. Think of how they feel. You think of how many millions of Malaysian business owners in Malaysia feel like that. There's about 5 million of them because I checked with the statistics. Now that took me 20 something seconds and maybe I've already got this effect that that's a great idea. Next, let's talk about making it huge. So I talk about some numbers so you're starting to feel like it's going to be huge, right? Now here's a big mistake a lot of startups make. They start talking about industry size. Did you know the market for CRM is 9 billion trillion dollars a year according to Forrester Research in 2019? What does that mean to me? What does that mean to you? What, you're gonna take all of that? Is that what it means? <laughs> like that, ugh, man, I hate those numbers. They don't mean anything. You, you, you basically wasted about 20 seconds of somebody's life because you're talking about Forrester Research says it's $9 trillion. It is not gonna affect you. Now those type of market sizing is useful in different ways, especially when companies get really big and they are like 20% market share. So you say the market share is 9 trillion, you actually get 20% of that. But until you become that size, top-down market sizing is not that helpful. It's a waste of your time. What I like is bottom-up market sizing. Now, bottom-up bottom calculations is this. So let me, let, let's say this. Um, how many customers are you getting every month? Uh, around four to five customers. Uh, every week? One, one or two. One or two. Yeah. Uh, you want two customers a week. Are you doing direct selling or using online? Uh, we are doing both. Uh, both. We, we do online the Google AdWords, Facebook stuff as well, as well as we do uh, we do events as well. We participate with our, uh, we, we have even partnered with Telecom and uh, Singtel in Singapore as well. So we are getting leads from there as well. Okay. Uh, one so, of the so because you're going for higher enterprises, like yeah, bigger, yeah, that's why yeah. sales cycles are longer. Okay, yes. got it. If you had a million dollars today, US dollars, about 3.3 3, 3, 3 million ringgit, how fast do you think you can get? How, how quickly, how many customers a week you can get? Uh, Actually, the, the whole dynamics will change if I have money because we then we'll shift it towards the enterprise sales. So I should have to make just one sale a month, which can give me something like 200,000 a year. I like that. And, uh, and, it, and it, how many can you make a month? You said four to five a month, right? Uh, again, depends on how many sales guys I have. If I say I have just one good guy, I'll get one deal a month. And one year is almost like two, two, two million. Uh, okay, so let's say you, okay, just for discussion's sake, let's say he raises, he wants to raise a million US dollars, and with a million US dollars, he can hire 10 salespeople, right? So what you'll say from bottom-up sizing is this. Today, without funding, 
I'm getting one new customer a week. This, each customer I get is worth up to 200,000 ringgit a year. Uh, not not at this moment of time, oh, because we are still uh, talking to the smaller customers. Oh, I see, the I moment see. I get the better enterprise sales guy, you know, uh, maybe okay, good, good, good. Good. okay, let's say you're getting one of those customers a year, yeah. right? So right now, at my current rate, I can, all I need is one enterprise customer a year, I make 200,000 ringgit. Once I raise my money, I get 10 salespeople, and if I get 10 enterprise customers a year, that's um, 2 million ringgit a year. And this 10... Um, enterprise customers is out of a few thousand enterprise customers in Malaysia and Singapore. So this kind of bottom-up sizing. So I'll think to myself, I'll be like, huh, this guy is only saying he wants to get 10 customers? Man, he should be going for more customers. So you want to kind of like almost, I wouldn't say trick them, but you, don't, you want to be kind of humble with some of your bottom-up projections so they feel it's a bit conservative. You could also say it like in a way where you... Um, he said, okay, right now I'm having one customer a year and he's giving 200,000 ringgit and that's with no salespeople, just me. Yeah. I want to hire 10 salespeople. I want to train them up and I want them to go out to the market. Think of how many enterprise customers I can get. Conservatively, I can get 10. And that's worth 2 million ringgit a year. And all I'm raising is 1 million ringgit right now. That's bottom up sizing. So for any of you who serve a some amount of customers, the trick to bottom up sizing is just calculate how many customers you're doing now, you raise money, how much more can you get, and that's out of pool of how many customers you can reach. The next thing to make this, this is going to be huge. You can say that how exactly will you reach X number of customers. So in your case, you mentioned it's going to be enterprise sales, right? So tell me, is it very easy to hire enterprise sales people? Uh, without funding, it's not easy. Because with, with, funding, with, funding, with, funding. <laughs> with funding, I think it's okay. It's not that difficult to hire. Where, where yeah. do you normally get them from? I mean, there are a lot of other companies who are in traditionally selling the ERP, CRM solutions. We, we, can, we can get it from there. Got it. So he can say, so he, he would say that, okay, one customer gets me 200,000 ringgit today. No salespeople. I'm going to raise a million ringgit. I'm going to hire 10 salespeople. I'm going to get 2 million ringgit. How will I get this 10 salespeople? There's a lot of traditional, small CRM, ERP guys where people are just in, stuck in that shithole job for a couple of years. When I come along with my big swinging funding, right, and my charming turban, right, I'll be able to get them. <laughs> I'll be able to hire from that pool. So you want to say it in a way where it sounds very believable, but that's all you need to do. Talk to these guys, you can get them. So for a lot of um, you guys who are doing consumer type businesses, what you want to say is this. A lot of startups will say, oh, we got 2,000 users with no marketing budget. And they are, they're hoping people will be impressed. Well, it's kind of like, I don't know about other investors, but I am terribly unimpressed. Because what it means is, you don't know how you got 2,000 users. If I'm give you a, like 100K, you might not know how to spend 100K to get the next 2,000 users. You basically don't know. What I prefer to hear is this. I've got 2,000 users of my app, and this is just out of 5 million moms in Malaysia. And I did this just spending 12 ringgit on Facebook. So I would be thinking at this point, wow, this can be huge. What if I gave them 12 million ringgit? Maybe they can get all the moms, you know, I wouldn't think like that, but, you know, the trajectory would flow in that direction. So that's kind of like using bottom-up sizing and talking about how you're actually going to achieve that 20 customers, the 10 customers you're going to get. All this doesn't take a lot of time, just one or two sentences. Thirdly, oh, I already mentioned this, right, you could stack it up there or down, but it's like, how big of a business will you be if you reach X number of customers? So, for example, if you had 10 customers, you would be a 2 million ringgit business. You guys get this? You guys ready for number four? Hey, you guys want number four or not? Yes. Okay, just had to hear it. Okay, this is the team to do it. Now, a lot of startups will say, uh, okay, so uh, my team, uh, this is uh, John, um, uh, uh, Batlisham over here is my uh, CEO, and then uh, uh, Romy over here is my uh, UX ninja, and then um, uh, Jokovic over here, Jokowi over here is my... Uh, programming rock star, and then here's my, I mean, then you start talking about the names and what these people do. Look, I don't know who this Romy is. I don't know who Bobby is, and I, I don't know if Bobby's any good. You call him a rock star. I haven't heard of him. I didn't rock out to his songs. You know I mean? So let me tell you how to make a good team slide. You should open up with this. For this, okay, tell me, um, if she, why don't you tell me about your team? Uh, we are three people and we have more than 30 years of combined experience in building solutions for businesses, especially working on smaller businesses. Do, do, do you guys already have an existing network of uh, enterprise 
customers before you started this? Uh, yeah, in our previous companies, we definitely have, but of course, we don't uh, churi those guys and you know try to do that. But yes, we have relationships. So here's is an enterprise uh, sales kind of company. So first thing he's got to qualify is that you got to tell people what is it gonna what your team needs to win. So you're gonna say, for my company, I need seasoned local enterprise salespeople to win, the best local salespeople to win. And me, the founder, Deep, I've spent 30 years of my life, as you know, your, your team has 30 years. Okay, me and my team, we spent 30 years collectively serving local customers. We understand their pains, we understand how to get this done. That's why I'm talking to you here today. Um, is there anything else that's very interesting about your team that makes it very, you know, amazing? Uh, it, it's a pretty diverse team. We have people from uh, India, Iran, and Mauritius. Okay, that's interesting, but... Um, I mean, not interesting enough. Okay, your CTO, has he or she built anything so epic? Uh, no, no, we are not celebrities. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, okay, okay, that's okay. Like I said, you don't need all five, right? You can get like three out of five, that's fine. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, you're good, you're good, you're good. So, I'll give you another example. I'll, I'll use somebody else's example. Um, so, I was helping my uh, girlfriend for a pitch this afternoon, right? So, um, <laughs> so she, ha she has an app which requires... Um, her app actually requires a very good, it's like a consumer app, right? So it requires a very good marketer, it requires a very good CTO, and it requires someone who's really good at designing crime algorithms, understanding crime data. So the team that she's assembled, the CEO built a 150-person tech team for Experian here in Malaysia. She helped build and manage the community for a 15 million US dollar a year internet marketing business. Her advisor for the crime data is the world's renowned researcher in crime data, based in the US. Took me about 20 seconds. I told you what's important for the business, and I told you how exactly the team is the right people with the right skills. You see that? Yeah, but you won't always have this kind of celebrity stuff, right? It's okay, it's okay. You just focus on one. So for example, for yourself, right, the good thing about your kind of thing is that, I mean, this reality of enterprise, even if your product was a bit shitty, if your salespeople are quite good, sometimes they buy it. Yep. This is why all the enterprise software you use in a lot of companies are pretty shitty. <laughs> oh, it's true. It's true. I mean, I mean, all you use work in corporate, you know what I'm talking about, right? You're forced to use this system and uh, the buttons over there. It feels like it was designed in 20 years ago. But so, so, like, so you, what you can say is that all it takes for me to make my 2 million ringgit this year of revenues is to get 20 customers. And all I need is great local salespeople. And me and my team, we know how to hire them, we know how to groom them, we know how to train them, because collectively, we spent 30 years on it. Yeah. That's enough. They quickly move on to the next thing. Lastly, you're building up the effect. Imagine if you, you, you hit them on all four effects, really, you're on to the fifth effect. The fifth effect is that I must feel that I want to be part of your dream. I want to be part of your business in some way. Now, what you can do is that you can highlight some of your some of your put your best foot forward things, you highlight some of your attraction again. You know, some of your key highlights, just reiterate. For example, your attraction is pretty amazing, right? So you say, all right, so ladies and gentlemen, like I've plowed through three years of my life to get this 100 customers, including McDonald's and all of these guys, because I know that this is the start of something huge, right? So just reiterating traction. And then you start qualifying the kind of investors you want. Now this is like, you're saying, I will, instead of saying, I will take anyone who's willing to throw money at me. You kind of try to qualify your audience a little bit. So anyone in this room who knows a small business owner, who knows a ton of small business owners, anyone who has network or expertise in enterprise sales, be part of this stream. So you qualify exactly what they need. So with that, you have it. That is the pitch effect you need to create. Number one, I want to know more. Number two, what a great idea. As Deep is talking to me, I'm like, wow, this is going to be huge. Damn it, this is the team to do it. I want to be part of this. For those who are pitching this afternoon, there's going to be, um, I think, what, 20 companies pitching, I think, or so. You watch them, and then those of you in the audience, you think, and then you think about these effects. You try and observe your emotions, you observe your body language to see whether or not their pictures is having this effect on you. In fact, that's very good practice. You put these five effects down there, and then you put a checkbox whether they're not hitting that mark. 
And if they happen to give you another effect, like, oh, that's disgusting. You know, why did you... Right? I mean, you just write that down. You're just observing yourself. And this kind of empathy will help you kind of uh, evaluate your own pitch as well. Now, lastly, I like a deep... Thank you very much, man. You've been such a real sport, right? Thank you. Thank such you. It's a pleasure. And, and, uh, uh, just one thing to maybe organizers, since we got this presentation now, we should have a chance to update our presentation slides, which I think we don't <laughs> have. No, 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 no. No time, bro. Welcome to the real world. No, but, thank, but thanks. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Deep. And your turban is charming. I meant all of that. Okay, in closing, I'd like to say that we're here talking about three minutes and pitching investors. But when times are tough, man, um, you're not only pitching investors, most of the time you wake up in the morning wondering why you're even doing it in the first place, you got to pitch yourself. You will not be able to pitch anyone if you can't pitch yourself. If your own pitch doesn't excite you when you say it, if your own pitch doesn't make you want to say it all the time to everybody, if you're nervous about saying your pitch because you don't feel you believe it, that's a problem. The first person to pitch is you need to pitch yourself. So when you run through your pitch with yourself, get that feeling. Try to get that feeling. Because you're going to need it not only to pitch investors, you're going to need to pitch your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your best, your well-meaning friend who's trying to offer you a safer job. You're, you're, you need to pitch your everybody, you know, moms, aunties, neighbors, sons, dog, everyone you meet who's telling you not to do it, you're going to have to pitch them. You're going to pitch them, make them want to join you and do it. Pitching employees, yeah, I forgot about that. You know, a lot of people ask, oh, how do I get good talent, you know? Sometimes you've got a crappy pitch. No matter how good your company is, nobody wants to join your company. So you've got to pitch employees too. But most important, like I said, you've got to learn to pitch yourself. So with that, I'd like you to send me your pitch. Send me a pitch. You can tweet me, at Kylie. You can uh, message me on Facebook. You can uh, tag me on Instagram, Kylie Ng instead of Kylie. You can also email me at kylie at 500.co, not .com, .co. So send me your pitch decks if you have it. You know, I will take really long to reply it because I'm so incompetent at email. But eventually when I get to it, I promise you that, you know, I'm going to give a bit of feedback on your pitch deck, okay? And that's only special to you guys. So don't, like, share the email out around everywhere. <laughs> so, right? So you guys send me your pitch decks. I'm happy to give you some feedback. All right. Day three of day five of MSA and the start of many, many more days uh, to come. Thank you very much.